section. Uh, we're just going to get a little more, a little more technical and get into some of the stuff we just talked about in the Swing Essentials. Swing Essentials is, you know, the gotta have it. You know, some of the fundamentals of a good swing. So here we're going to break it down just a little bit more and talk and talk about it. So we're going to start from the ground again. We get our energy from the ground. This this session is called less more less. What what I'm finding when I start talking to the hitters is I think hitters are doing trying to do too much with their feet. All right. So I want I'm going to try to explain. I want you to do less with your feet, more with the hips and less with the hands. So that's where the less more less comes from. All right. So less with the feet. I kind of talked about it a little earlier. It's all in the stride. Again, we think that because the pitch is away, we have to really go get it with our foot. And that's going to get us in trouble. If we step too far, we're going to lock out our hips. We're not going to be able to get through the ball. We'll still be able to hit the outside pitch, but you're going to hit it with all arms. All right. The crazy thing about softball is the good news is we rarely ever swing and miss. All right. The bad news is we rarely ever swing and miss. So if you take a bad swing, in baseball, you take a bad swing or swing at a bad pitch, you miss it. And that's a good thing because now you get another shot. You get three of those before they send you back to the dugout, right? The bad news is in softball, if we swing at a bad pitch, we hit it. All right. If we take a bad swing, we still hit the ball. It's not going to go very far. It's not going to go where you wanted it to go. You with me on that? So that's the good news and the bad news and the whole idea. So if you take a bad swing, if you step after the ball, you're still going to hit it. We rarely swing and miss. But now you've locked your hips, you're not going to be able to get a whole lot on it. All right? So I want you to do just a little bit less with the feet. Biggest thing, again, we just got to get, get our foot down and put ourselves in position to succeed. We want to step somewhere where we have a strong base that we can spin upon under control and under balance. All right. So we don't need to dive in. We don't need to step out on an inside pitch and we don't need to overstride. However, we can, what a lot of guys will do in softball is, is they'll pick that foot up and they'll give themselves a little bit of, when we do this, what do you think that's doing? It's definitely loading. You're loading on your back foot. What, trying to generate more power. Okay. Yeah. What it really is, guys, it's, a, it's an assurance that you're getting your weight back, definitely. But what people usually do it for, it's a timing mechanism. Okay? I don't know that you're really loading up and getting more power. Because I explained to you earlier, nothing important happens until the front foot hits the ground. We get our energy from the ground. So anything we do before the foot gets down isn't necessarily going to give us more power. Our power is created, our energy is created once the foot hits the ground. All right. So what a lot of guys do is they'll use that for timing. All right. They'll pick that foot up and then when it's time to go, they'll set it down. Now it becomes a trigger. Once that front foot hits the ground, it's time to go. All right. So what they'll do is they'll pick that thing up. They'll let it hang. If it's a high pitch, they'll let it hang, let it hang. And then when it's time to go, they'll set that foot down. Now, here's what we don't want to do. What I don't want you guys to do is when you pick the foot up, I don't want you to fall onto it. All right. And that's what a lot of guys do. So now what happens is your linear motion is happening too soon. When should we actually move forward? When should we use that linear motion in our swing? As a part of the swing, we do that with the hands. So this is a problem when some people start, and this is part of the doing too much. They think they're doing something good, and then they go here. Now I've moved forward before my hands did anything. All right? That's not good. 
So what we really want to be able to do is pick that foot up and put it down while staying back. All right. So my thought process is this. When the foot goes forward, the hand should go back. That's a way of stopping you from leaking forward. So watch me. When the foot goes forward, my hands go back. Look at my head. Does it move at all? So I can put that foot down and still not move forward if I'm doing everything right, if I'm staying back. But a lot of guys want to go here and then forward. It should look like this. Pick it up, put it down, stay back, and then once that foot gets down, then I rotate. All right? I don't want you to jump or fall onto that front foot. With me? So that's a misconception. Those guys that like to lift that leg, it's great to do, but you've got to stay here. You've got to stay back. Do not do this. Do not go forward with your stride. Step away from your hands and then go. Everybody understand that? So my simplest way, and I'm all about keeping it simple, you don't have to pick it up. You can still time it. There's some that'll just do this. I know this is in the way. There's some that'll just do this with their feet. All right, here comes the pitch. That's okay too. It's the same thing as picking it up and going. All right, so I don't think that lifting that leg is gonna give you a whole lot more power. All right, it's gonna help you get it down and stay back, which is the big thing, stay on that backside. So it can be as simple as the little, the little wave of the foot, all right, and rotate. You could possibly do the big leg lift, you know, where it's here, down and stay back. That caused me to get on top of that one, all right? Or it could just be a simple, here comes the pitch, get that foot down and go. All right, so keep it simple. So I'm telling you, do a little bit less with the bottom half. Now let's talk about doing more. Everybody up, everybody up, everybody up, let's go. This is the movement time. Half circle around me. I want you looking towards me as if I'm the pitcher. Now, this is the more time. I want you guys to do more with your hips. All right? More with your hips. We talked earlier the hips the hips are a doorway. All right? The hips are a doorway. We get our energy from the ground. We're moving it up to the shoulder level, to the hands. All right. And this door right here has to open up. All right. So put your bat down for a second. Put your hands on your hips here. And all we want to do is turn 90 degrees. So I want everybody to go right here. All right. Now let's feel the dynamics of the feet. I want you to start with this heel up. Your front heel up, all right, got that? When you're done, when we turn, that heel's gonna come down and this knee is gonna go from flexion to extension, all right? That knee is gonna go from flexion to extension. This knee is actually gonna push forward a little bit, see that? So everybody do that, nice and so, hands on the hips. All right, I want you to put it down, now turn the hips, 90 degrees. Get that back hip through, good, Let's do it again. So you're gonna finish, you're gonna start this heel up to heel down. This one's gonna go from heel down to heel up. If you see some pictures of Bonds back in the day, when Barry was done hitting, he was like this. This foot was up, this foot was here, you see that? He was heel of his front foot and toe on the back foot. And that's that nice rotation that we get. Look at that. All right. So I want you to feel that action right now. So hands on the hips. Let's just turn 90 degrees. Take a picture of the picture with your belly button. Back and forth. Look at me. I want you to feel the feet, the feet work. Feel it? I want you to rock back and forth. You're going to go from your back foot to in between your feet. Back foot to in between your feet. All right. 90 degrees is all we're turning. Got it? That's it. 
Do it in between. Don't get out on your front foot, though. Try to stay in between the feet. All right, so we can also take the bat. If you got a bat with you, we can put it here. All right, we can do the same concept. Turn. Turn the hips. The back foot, the end result of the back foot is you're going to spin on your back toe. Squishing the bug has gotten a, a negative wrap in the days. Squishing of the bug is not creating power. The squishing of the bug, the turning of the back foot, is the end result of your back hip turning. But get up on that back toe, though, for me. Get up here. Yep, that's it. Okay? A quarter turn. Get up. Get that back heel off the ground, big man. Get it off the ground. Good. Good, good, good. Very good. Turn it. Yep. <laughs> you don't have to get on your front heel. That's more so when we really spread out where you're on the heel. But just get up on that back toe. Quarter turn. Nice. Quarter turn. Quarter turn. All right. So now this is the part where I would push a button and chubby checkers would come on and we'd all be doing the twist. But really, this is the concept I want you to get. We go from here. This leg is going to go boom. This leg, sometimes I'll say I want you to introduce your right knee to your left knee. I want you to almost put those knees together. But it's almost like doing the twist. Everybody go. Let's go. Do the twist. Take that right knee, drive it to your left knee. Your front knee is going to go from flexion to extension. Flexion to extension. Nope. Watch this knee. Flexion to extension. See how it becomes straight? Straighten that left knee out. Stay back, rotate. Flexion to extension. Twist. Twist. Take your back knee and drive it at your front knee. You can still do it with the bat behind you if you want. But how fast can you do that? Ha! Look at me. Look at me. Bam. Bam. You ever seen, uh, I think it was Aaron Rodgers or one of the quarterbacks? They do that little drill where they... They do, they do that. That's kind of what they're doing. That's what I want you guys. I want you really thinking about this. How quick. Do your best Elvis impersonation. All right. How quick can you fire those hips? Turn them. You got to turn the hips. Turn the hips. Turn the hips. If we can do more, the more you can do with that lower half, the better off you're going to be. Yeah. There you go. There's Elvis the pelvis right there, baby. That's it. But that's what hitting is all about. We're going boom, boom. You're kind of, you're almost even standing up a little bit, you know. Huh, huh. Everybody, come on. How fast can you fire those hips? Bam. Kind of feels funny right now, but drive that back knee forward. That left knee is going to go to extension. You're going to straighten out that front knee. Fire. Yes. The closer your feet are together, the easier it is to twist. If you got bad knees, big man, you all right? Yeah, I'm okay. okay. That's it. Boom. Fire those hips. The faster you can fire those hips, the better we're going to be. And I'm going to tell you in a minute and show you why. Everybody all right? Okay. All right. So I want you to do more, 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 more with those hips. All right. Because that's going to help us create a little more bat speed. I'm not going to get into the technicalities of coiling and creating a little bit more there. I don't think we need to on this one. But I just want you to be able to fire those hips. All right, now I want you to see what happens when we do that. This is a pretty cool drill. We're all going to do it in a second. I want you to watch me first. If I choke up and put my bottom hand here and I set that bat on my shoulder... All right, if I do everything right, if I get my foot down, stay back, give me a little bit of linear, and fire those hips, watch what that, and just let my bat, I'm just going to set it here, watch what happens to my bat. My bat wants to go. The more I fire them hips, that bat wants to go. That's the centrifugal force that we're talking about. The, yes, the rotation of the body creates that and that bat wants to go i'm not doing anything with my hands yeah be careful 
I'm not doing anything with my hands. It's just going. And then you can put your top hand on here. Look at me. Do it in your top hand. You can spread out now and do it. Get me a circle if you want. But I want you to feel that. Set it on your shoulder. Watch me. And now the, when I fire those hips, that bat wants to go. It wants to leave my shoulder. The quicker you spin, the better that bat goes. All right? Choke up a little bit on it and make sure you hold on to it. Feel it? Create bat speed with your hips. Nice. Very nice. Good. Either hand. Create bat speed with your hips. Come on away from the fence and let it loose. Let it come off your shoulder. You're not really using your hand, right? You're firing the hips and that bat wants to go. A couple more times. Nice. Ha! It's almost like having a, a sword. The rotation of the body helps those guys. Ha! You know, whatever it takes. So now, if you take your bat, let's put both hands on it. Ready? Put both hands on. You don't have to choke up anymore. Just set it on your shoulder. Now, as we get up to the hands, we're back to the less part. Less, more, less. I want you to do less with the hands and just let it happen. So with what we just did, I want you to have both hands on the bat. All right. Both hands on the bat. I want you to fire the hips. All right. But let's do this first. I want you to keep the bat on your shoulder and just turn the hips. Everybody feel that. Back leg, front leg, rotate the hips and see what the hands stay connected. See how the hands want to go? They want to go, don't they? So the turning of the hips initiates the movement of the hands. And now I want you to do what we just did. I want you to fire the hips and let the hands go. Just let them go. Don't swing with your hands. Just let them go. All right. So here we go. It looks like this. Fire the hips and let the hands go. Go. I want you to feel like you're not doing anything with the hands. You're just holding on to the bat, right? But if you ask me, that looks like a pretty good swing right there. Don't get out of way. Yep. Stay connected. Keep your hands and elbows in. Stay connected. And the initial part of the swing gets started by the hips. Feel that? So understand the concept. The faster you spin, the farther it goes, because that's true. But what happens with us is we try to do too much with our hands. All right? We try to do too much with our hands. We'll overreact on the outside pitch and try to go get it. Or we'll overreact on that low pitch and do too much with our hands. Or on the inside pitch, we'll fly open like we're swinging out a pinata. And we'll hit it a mile foul. We're doing too much. I want you to do less with your hands. Less with your hands. Stay connected. Stay connected. And then once it gets moving and gets started, now we're just going to adjust to where the ball is. All right? Everybody understand that? So the left hand, again, we want to stay. We want to go from flexion to extension here. And that left hand is now going to guide the bat through the zone. And then your right hand is the one that controls the barrel. Your right hand is going to send the barrel to where it needs to go. So don't overdo it with the hands. Don't drop the hands on the low ball. Don't raise the hands on the upper pitch. All right, back it up a little bit. I'm going to hit a couple. And we're going to let you guys slide in here. So how simple is that now, knowing all we really got to do is get that foot down, all right? However you want to get it down, get it down without falling on it. We want to introduce the knees to each other, all right? We want to do the twist. So that's going to happen. As we're doing that, our hands are going to get initiated, all right? And then the last thing we do is we just throw that barrel at the ball. So foot down, fire the hips, and throw the hands, all right? There's no secret to this thing. 
it's not as hard. We make it harder than it is. Stay connected. You ever see a big leg check swing? Sometimes it's just boom. The difference between a swing and no swing is throw the hands. So get your foot down, fire the hips, let the hands move, and then throw the hands and throw the barrel. Let that kinetic energy out. All right? Come on in a little bit. Let's talk about agonist versus antagonist. All right. So this action here, right? We start it, and then we're going to extend the left arm. What muscle is responsible for extension of this arm? Tricep. Tricep all right? So that's the agonist, which means it's the muscle that's working is the tricep. Now, in our body, we have an agonist and an antagonist. So if the tricep is responsible for extension, what muscle is responsible for flexion? The bicep. The bicep. Got it? So our tricep extends the arm, our bicep flexes the arm. When we're up to bat, all right, and we're trying to hit, we want the tricep to work, what's the bicep got to be doing? It's got to be relaxed. If not, they're going to fight each other. All right? And you know what happens when the, when the game's on the line or in the big situation or sometimes it's, batting practice versus game in batting practice i was relaxed i did everything i was supposed to nice and smooth it went good game time comes around man your girlfriend's in the crowd you know uh i've got to get a couple hits you know i'm trying to make the travel team or whatever it is what do we do we get a little more excited and what happens everybody grab your bat all right you really want it, this one. Game's on the line, man. Home run wins it. Go ahead, everybody squeeze it. Squeeze it, squeeze it. So what just happened? Yeah, big man here. What just happened? He Because he squeezed the bat and tried hard, his biceps are contracted and so are his triceps. So now as he goes to swing and that tricep's supposed to be working, what's fighting against the tricep? The bicep. What is that going to do to your swing? It's going to slow it down. All right? It's going to slow it down. So that's what happens in the big situation or just the fact that, you know, it's game time. We get out there and we try so hard that we squeeze the life out of it. Okay? It's not just the squeezing. It's the contraction of the antagonist. They start working against each other. It happens on the free throw line all the time. Guys, 10 for 10 throughout the game. Now the game's on the line. All right, one second left, we're down by two. When they miss, do they usually miss long or short? They usually miss short. And why? Same thing. Look at this. What is this? Extension. Extension of the arm. That's tricep. So if he's tensed and scared and you go, that bicep fights it a little bit, the ball's going to come up short and they miss. We call it choking. All right? We call it choking, and that's exactly what happens. I want you to do less with your hands. Don't get in there and try to do so much and try to kill the ball. If you try to kill the ball, what are you going to do? You're going to squeeze down on the bat. When we squeeze down on the bat, everything, your pecs will even flex. Every muscle in your wrists and forearm will contract, I guess the word should be, not flex. And when it's contracted, it doesn't move as well. All right, that guy with ice in his veins, sometimes it's the stupidest guy on your team. That's the guy you want up in the big situation. He don't know any better. Or that happy-go-lucky guy. Oh, uh, I don't care if we lose. Let me up there. That's kind of the guy you want up there. It's the passionate guy, the guy that has the will to win. You know, the competitor in us sometimes works against us. And that's exactly the science of it. So I want you to do less with the hands. Don't try to do so much with the hands. Let it happen. Let it happen. And when that top hand gets dominant, all right, if you really go hard with it, and, and there's people, I mean, we teach release the bad head. You, or bogey teaches snap, all right? Snap, snap, snap. He wants you to throw that bad head. We all do. We all want to create bat speed by 
boom, throwing that. But what if you do it too much? All right. If that top hand, if you're so worried about throwing that barrel and that top hand gets going, it could cause you to roll that bat over a little early. All right. So I don't want your top hand dominant. We talked about putting the bat out in your fingers. That's half the battle. All right. If the bat is back in your hand and you've got it lined up this way, watch this. I'm going to do slow motion. But... I'm just going to go here where the punching knuckle is lined up with the knocking knuckle. I want you here, but I'm going to go here because some of us really like to get in this position. There's the bat again. Back in my hand. I don't want it there. But watch what happens with just with this grip. All right. I want you to read my Worth logo from behind. Here comes slow motion. There's that ball. That's where I want to make contact with it out in front. But because of my grip, here's what happens. As I turn the hips and do that well and extend this left arm, once that left arm gets extension right there, I'm palm up, palm down. All right? I'm not at the ball yet. Watch what happens now as I get to that ball. My left arm is fully extended. Now my right arm is going to go to extension. And what happens is watch the logo on the bat. It comes up. In fast motion, you don't see it as much. But in slow motion, you can see how it goes from here. When this right hand rolls over the left hand, the bat can't help but come up. You understand that? So now instead of hitting the bottom of the ball where I can get it in the air, I'm starting the rollover, and I'm going to hit the top of the ball, and I'm going to hit a ground out to the shortstop. All right? And that's the worst thing you can do with a runner on first or first and second. But I was trying to go right center. Well, I tried a little too hard. My top hand took over, which caused the bat to roll a little too soon. And it caused me to hit the top of the ball. All right. Which ends up being a ground ball. So if I get here and then start to roll, I'm going to go. And there's the rollover. It doesn't look so bad at full speed. But that's exactly what's happening. We're hitting ground balls when we shouldn't be. All right. So that's another case of trying to do too much. Don't do too much with the hands. Do less with the hands. Let them work. Let them work. All right. Let that eye hand coordination get in there. Everybody understand that? So that's the biggest thing is muscling up, trying too hard. All right. The last thing is that front shoulder pulling off. All right. If the front shoulder leads the way, notice when I teach hitting, I teach feet, hips, and hands. Did I say anything about the shoulder? The shoulder is a non-teach. If you're doing everything right, the shoulder is going to take care of itself. It's going to move out of the way. What we don't want to do is lead with the shoulder, and that's called flying open or pulling off the ball. You could have a great grip, but fly open and pull off and look what's going to happen to that i'm going to get out here and roll over and pull that sucker all right so the front shoulder has got to stay closed anybody have a front shoulder problem pulling the front shoulder okay the front shoulder's got to stay closed here's the best drill for it i showed a couple of you i want you to choke up all right and I want you to hit some line drives over that second baseman's head. So I'm going to choke up, and I'm going to hit a couple line drives over that second baseman's head. The only way I can do that is to keep my shoulder in. I've shortened the bat. If I pull off, I'm going to miss because I've shortened the bat with the choke up. All right, I'm going to hit it off the end. So in order for me to hit this over the second baseman's head, I've really got to keep the shoulder in, let the hands go. So notice the hands will move my shoulder out of the way. Don't lead with the shoulder. All right. So the best drill, if you're a, if you're a front side flying open, choke up and hit a few line drives over that second baseman's head. And I'll let you guys do this in a second. Hands inside. All right. That's going to teach. Once you do 20, 25 of those, 
that shoulder's going to stay closed. Now you can back off the ball, grip down again, and really emphasize about keeping your shoulder. When your shoulder goes, what else goes with it? Your head. All right. Anybody been accused of pulling their head? We usually do that in a home run derby. We usually do that when we're trying to hit a home run. All right. We think more is better. I'm telling you now, less is better. Less with the hands is better. More is not better. So we get up there and we try to go and we yank the head and pull the shoulder. We just shortened our bat again. So work more on letting your hips get the hands going and then just let the hands do their thing. Fire the hips, let the hands do their thing. Does it look like I'm swinging hard when I hit the ball? I've been accused of not really trying. <laughs> You're not even trying in there. I am trying, all right? But I know better than to, I've, I've got guys that, you know, that's a muscular swing. That's a full on go to town swing. I don't believe in that. I think that is less consistent. Do, you have a full -on swing? Do I have one? Yeah. I just showed it to you. It doesn't look much. All right, I'm going to try to hit one. See that palm tree there? Little wind in the face. Ball off the tee. Not the best balls in the world, but I'm going to try to hit one towards that palm tree. So you'd think I need to muscle up on it. All right, watch me first, and then we'll watch where it goes. Tell me if it looks like I swung harder on this one. Ready? There's that palm tree. <laughs> Did I swing harder at that ball? Maybe a tad. So what we all have to do is find that, I call it intensity level. You gotta find that intensity level that works for you. Everybody listen to music? What happens if you put it all the way up to a 10? You turn that shit all the way up, you say, I love it. What happens when you turn it all the way up to 10? It gets distorted. It's too loud. It gives you a headache. The neighbors call the cops. All right? We don't want to listen to it at 10. We don't want to swing at our maximum velocity. We don't ever want to do that. What number is nice? 7. 7.5. Maybe 8. All right? That's how you should be swinging. All right, you should be swinging at that. I told the story a minute ago. Let's try it again. Nice and easy. I'm going to swing at 7.8. Here it goes. All right. I didn't swing real hard, and that ball's hit decent. I got to see Jacob DeGrom pitch one day. I live in Port St. Lucie, Fort Pierce, where the Mets do spring training. A couple years ago, DeGrom was still with it, and he was coming back from rehab. So I went over and watched him in the bullpen. I was absolutely amazed at how smooth, how smooth and easy it looked. 98, 98, 99. It's like, oh my God, he's not even trying. That's kind of what you want. It's a compliment for someone to say, wow, you're not even swinging hard, right? It shouldn't look like you're swinging as hard as you can because you really shouldn't be. Why? Because we just talked about it. Now you got muscles working against each other, all right? It's called smooth and ballistic. You want to be ballistic. Let the muscles work that are supposed to work. DeGrom, and here's the expression we use. I want you to swing hard, easy. Swing hard, easy. DeGrom throws hard, easy. Okay? So I want you to swing hard, easy. Make it look like you're not really trying, but inside you know you're getting after it, right? Man, I put a good swing on that. But don't overswing. We don't want to overswing. Pick it up, put it down. Fire the hips. If anything looks violent, it should be Elvis going to jail. All right? Because his hips were moving too much. If anything goes violent, it should be the middle section, not the feet or not the hands. We got people out there, we're okay. So all it should look like is here comes the pitch, all right? Swing hard easy and put a good barrel on it and let it go. Let it happen. Got it? Any questions? Come on, fire away. No questions? I did so good. You got to understand. Thanks.
and and the last thing I heard, uh, Ed Rose, who was here earlier, he always he's throwing stuff up on his little thing. He put up one the other day about focus, and it's a word I use a lot. And the last thing you really need to do is focus. When you get in the box, just focus. We're asking for what? You get four at bats in a game, maybe five. How long does that at bat take? 30 seconds to a minute, right? If you take a few pitches. So four at bats, we're asking you to focus, really mentally get tough, focus for five minutes a game. Can we do that? Yeah. But when you get in the box, really focus. What's that going to do for you? What are you really focusing with? Your eyes, which engages your brain. And we talked about that earlier, that the eye-hand coordination is incredible. All right? The brain sees the pitch, processes the pitch. If you're not focusing on the ball, you might miss that it's a breaking ball. You might miss. You're not going to miss that it's a knuckleball, right? Those kind of stand out a little bit. But you might miss that it's a spinner, a backspin. All right? You might miss that it's going to break left to right or it's tilting right to left. Or you might miss that the wind pushed the ball. Does that happen in softball? Does the wind affect the pitch? Sure it does. How many? Huh? Yes, you can. That's called staring. Don't stare. Just focus. Look at the ball. Don't, you know, staring at something's different than just focusing on it. I was doing a pitching lesson the other day, and the kid's all over the place. So I watched his eyes, and he starts okay, and then he checks out his feet, and then he picked up his knee, and he looked to see how mom was doing, and then, oh, he threw it home, and he's all over the place. I said, dude, listen, all I want you to do is just put your eyes on the glove. Put your eyes on the glove. So now he went through his delivery. Eyes were on the glove. Boom. He threw eight in a row that hit the glove. Seven and eight, he had a big smile on his face as he was doing it. He couldn't believe it. And I said, listen, the brain is a very powerful thing. If you look at your spot, the brain will send the impulses to the body, and it'll happen. It'll happen. So when we get in the box, sometimes you need to focus a little bit more. The biggest thing for me is I focus on bottom of the ball. Bottom of, not just the ball, but the bottom of the ball. Why? Why do I want to hit the bottom of the ball? I want to get it in the air. Why do I want to get it in the air? Because there's less fielders covering more real estate out here. All right, we talked about that earlier. From this foul pole to that foul pole, it's about 350 feet. Four guys, maybe even three. I face a lot of three-man outfields. Three guys covering 350 feet versus six guys covering 150 feet. We want to get the ball in the air, gentlemen. We want to get it into the grass. How many lawn darts do we hit? We miss the crap out of it. If you miss the crap out of it, miss it up because it's got a chance of getting out here and falling. If you miss the crap out of it down, what happens? You got infielders fighting over it. There's two guys fighting over that ball to pick up and throw you out with. All right? Yes, sir. Yes. As a hitter, do you ever go up there thinking ahead of time where you're going to play? Yes, the sir. Ball ball, yes, or sir. Are you waiting for the pitcher to see how they're pitching to you? Great question. Nope. Great question. A, I should know what the pitcher's doing. I should know if he's a knuckleballer, if he's throwing high and deep. If he's a flat guy and short, I should know what his tendencies are because I'm watching the other guys. What I do every time I get up, I find two places to hit the ball. I look around. I wait for the defense to stop, and I pick out two places. All right? If I look out there and I got left field line and left center gap, I will stand closer to the plate. So now I'm going to get a little closer to the plate because my two spots are left field line and left center gap. Now, if the pitch is on the inner half of the plate, I hit the line. If the pitch is on the outer half, I hit the gap. That is much better than picking out one spot. How many times you got up there and there's a huge hole? I've done this before. Right center's wide open. Oh, my God, you could drive a, an RV through that hole. All right, so I get in there and guess what I do? I take the first pitch and try to hit it over there. Even though it was way inside, I thought that that hole was going to go away, so I got to hit the first pitch. Or I thought, wow, that's such a big hole, I can hit any pitch over there. And now I take an inside pitch and try to force it over there, and I get myself out. 
Holy cow, are you pissed heading back to the dugout? And that hole is wide open. You know what I mean? Or that middle is wide open. So you only pick middle. Oh, middle's open. All right? And now he throws you a pitch that breaks away from you. So instead of hitting it to right center, you take that pitch breaking away from you and try to force it in the middle. And now what do you think I just did there? I just rolled over it, didn't I? Now I hit a one hopper to the pitcher because I tried to take an outside pitch. Now pick two spots, let the pitch dictate which spot you go to. Now I'd be lying to if, if I told you that every single at bat I did that, that I'd hit one of the two holes. I would think about 75% of the time I'm able to do that. There's the other 25 that it's, you just got to, oh shit, I just got to hit this one hard, right? You guys have all been there. All right. It's not the pitch to do it with. I've got two strikes on me. So, so, but the, you got to have a game plan. Don't go up there with just one spot. Pick out a couple spots. Look around. There's holes. There's holes out there. All right. And then try to execute your game plan. If the pitch changes things on you, now it's just barrel it up. Go ahead and hit it hard and let's see what happens. I'm telling you, uh, I'm not going to lie that, that I hit it where I'm aiming every single time. It's not true. But a majority of the time it is, all right? I don't want to get up there and just get lucky. And I know a lot of guys, their philosophy, I just want to hit it hard. We'll ask them straight up, what do you do when you get them? I just want to hit it hard. You know, we had Jeff Hall out here one year uh, ask, asking questions. Somebody said, you know, do you look around, you know where? And, oh, I just hit it hard. I swing hard in case I hit it. <laughs> that was Halsey's philosophy, all right? Back in the day, they used to be able to hit all the home runs they want. So they were able to do that. So they were free swing. If they got it near, it's a home run. If they missed it, it usually had top spin, and they got away with it. They didn't care where. But in our world now, we're limited on the number of home runs. You guys play C or D, you know, even B. What's B get in U-Trip? Six home runs, five home runs. And then in senior ball, we're limited. Major, you guys get five home runs, six home runs. We're limited on the home runs. We can't free swing anymore. All right. If you're one of those guys that has to worry about keeping it in the park. But yes, you got to have a game plan. Don't just get up there and get lucky because you're not going to get lucky as many times as you think you will. Have a game plan. Pick out two spots. I think I already know the answer to my question. Okay. How do you go out there and not think about like 10 different things you just learned on the swing? Like I know with golf, that's my problem. Yep. 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 So how do you go to the plate? How do you go to the plate and not think about 10 different things? It's a great point. All right, and here's the, here's the problem with coming to this. I just gave you a bunch of things to work on. I need you to figure out your top two flaws. Okay. Fix one or two things at a time. You can't fix everything at once. The easiest thing, and now they tell you it takes 2,000 reps to get rid of a bad habit. That's a lot of swings, all right? But if your problem is your stride, you can do... 300 of those a night in your living room without a bat in your hand. All right? Can't you? Yeah. You can just sit there, put it down, put it down, put it down and swing. You can do those. and You can knock out 2,000 reps fixing the lower half in a heartbeat. But if it's a hand problem, it's going to take you a little more. But that's why we go to the T. We put a net up so we don't have to go do that, pick up all the balls. We hit into a net. Now I can get 200 swings tonight, 200 tomorrow night. I knock out my 2,000 in 10 days, right? Is that the right math? Okay. So that's how you do that. When it is, my favorite expression, and Larry and I discussed this recently, is there is a time to think. There is a time not to think. Here's my expression. Practice with your head play with your heart practice with your head yes analyze stop oh i was early i flew off of that i was late analyze your practice swings yes okay think about what you're doing and make some adjustments don't get in the box in the game you hopefully are ready you've taken enough repetitions that now you can get in there and just let it happen all right if not you got to understand that and I've told people before, we've done some lessons, and I sent them home. I said, look, don't expect 
miracles right away. We actually have a construction vest that we'll put on somebody. And we use that. You're under construction. You're under construction. You got a two lane road, right? Everything's going good until about 3.30 in the afternoon. It starts backing up. All right. Five o'clock, it's bumper to bumper, right? So what if some genius comes and says, hey, we're going to widen the lane. We got a solution. We're going to go three lanes. But while they're under construction, what happens to that two lane road? It becomes one lane. You got a guy, the flag man there stopping you. Go, stop, go. That traffic got worse before it got better. But down the road, we know, oh, it's going to be three lanes. It's going to be great, right? Same thing with hitting. If I teach you something new and you try it, what's going to happen right away? You're going to feel uncomfortable. It's different. It's going to feel uncomfortable. And here's, unfortunately, here's what happens. Guys, try it, try it, try it. And after 300 reps, because we're in society where we get instant gratification, right? You want money? Go to the ATM. Venmo. All right. We want money? You got it. We used to have to wait for a check to come in the mail. You want a movie? It's on your phone. We used to have to go to the movie theater or go to Blockbuster. Instant gratification these days. Can you get instant gratification in a softball swing? No. You got to go under construction. You got to get worse before you get better. But teaching, this is why I don't like teaching the young kids anymore. They want it instantly. They don't want to work for it. And after 300 swings, they don't see a difference. What do they do? Oh, I used to hit better my old way. Well, sure you did, but you were a 250 hitter. I just made you a 200 hitter while you're under construction. But if you believe in it and you understand it, once you get better, you're going to be a 350 hitter. You got to work through the construction phase. All right. Don't expect miracles overnight. Sometimes you do get right away. You see a difference. It's really cool. All right. Because you're conscious about it. Right now, if you changed your grip and you got in there and you consciously thought about your grip and you started hitting it good, whoa, this is awesome. Two weeks from now, unconsciously, you get out there for batting practice. Coach O'Brien's long gone, all right? It's a couple weeks later. You're not focused. You get back in there and old habits come back. You didn't think about your grip. You kind of reverted back to the old one or the arm extension or whatever it may have been. And... Three weeks from now, you forgot everything we did, all right? And you reverted right back to where you were. So it is work under construction, work in progress. You got to work through the changes until you get comfortable with it. You understand that? Great question. But the thing is, when you do, while you're under construction, just have one or two triggers. I told the group earlier, my golf swing, I have to tell myself two things, left arm straight and hips on the downswing. If I don't say left arm straight, I'll get here and do this. I'll get here and get to, now I've just changed the, the length of my, you know, that's why they do that. That club, you put it right next to the ball. All right, right there. That's my distance. So now I can do whatever I want and I'll get, I'll get the club head back to the ball. But if I get up here and do this, I've just changed that this, and we definitely don't want to be doing this in golf, right? So I have to constantly tell myself two things that make me work. So right now, you may have to pick out the two things that are the biggest and say, all right, back out, you know, elbow or hands in or keep my head still, front shoulder closed, whatever it is that's your problem. You have to get it to the conscious mind. Understand the conscious and the unconscious part? Right? When you walk around, do we walk around thinking heel to toe, heel to toe, heel to toe? No. We walk every day of our lives. We don't think about what's happening down there. It's muscle memory. All right? But if we try to do something new, you've got to bring it to your conscious mind. You have to say it out loud. All right? And my biggest one is focus. I'll get into the box and I'll tell myself out loud, focus, focus. <laughs> and it works because I'm bringing it to the conscious part of my mind. So I focus. If I just get up there and I don't tell myself to focus, it's just another at bat. How many have we had in our lifetime? A bunch. It's just another at bat unless you really lock in and focus on it. Okay? So one or two triggers at a time until those are fixed. Fix the biggest problem first. 
in the business world, it was swallow the biggest frog first, then it's easier to eat the smaller frog, <laughs> you know, do the biggest project first, get that out of the way. All right, then it's easier to do the smaller ones. So fix your biggest flaw first and then go from there. In your demonstration, you're teaching this. Level. Starting from here. Yes. All of America starts like this. What's the gain in everybody doing this? Great question. If you got to go, go. If not, stick around. Watch this. We did that earlier. Watch what happens to this bat. When I change directions with my hands, the bat lays down. All right. It's called bat lag. If I go this way, the bat lags that way. If I go this way, the bat falls that way. You can get away with this because watch what happens. When I change directions with my hands, that bat lays down. All right. And in baseball, we don't mind it laying down because when we swing in baseball, we're going to have our hands above the barrel. All right. So they're actually going from here to here. In baseball, they're working on there. This is the new way of hitting now. They go from here to here really quick. So All right. So they're okay with that. Don't have it what? Do what? There's no coiled power there in softball. In baseball, it's different because they're actually doing this. They're adding more distance that their barrel moves. Softball, basically, you end up here anyway. So You're going to end up there anyway. But I, when I teach the masses, I'm going to take away that extra move. I think, was it you and I that had that discussion? I'm going to take away this move because usually what happens is when I change directions and that bat lays down here, it could lay down here. It could lay down here. You know what I mean? And now if it lays down here, now I got to get it. It's got to now come up to get to where I want to be. I want you and me to keep it simple, the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. I want to go right from here. Watch me. I want to swing level in softball. I want it to go from here to here. I can control that barrel path really easy. I mean, there's guys that do this, you know? I always found um, everything, like, I mean, I, I do it. I, I move my hands a lot. Yep. I come down. Yep. It's a timing thing. But at the end of the day, before I load out, when you here. when your front foot hits the ground, your hands are going to be and there. I end up here, yep. going straight through. Everything before this is really a comfort thing. Sure. Right. At least that's how I've I've always seen it. Yes. If you're comfortable, I mean, I got a buddy that's oh, yeah. like a samurai. Yeah. But at the end of the day, before he starts his swing, he's here. That's called the right. launch position. Right. So as soon as he gets the launch position, everything before that, I've always doesn't matter. It. Yeah, it's comfort. So but imagine being a sixty-year-old and doing that a bunch, I like to eliminate unnecessary actions because they cause awkwardness and fatigue. Yes. All right. Why not keep it simple? I mean, you tell me if I'm wrong. That's just a philosophy. Why not keep it simple where I can go from A to B? That's another base hit. All right. Why do I need to be doing all of this stuff because I've explained to the first group that nothing important happens till your front foot hits the ground. I got pictures on my phone. I've got, what is it, 24 of the greatest left-handed hitters of all time. And every single one of them are right here. All right, from Bonds and Griffey. Bonds and Griffey had totally different swings. But when that foot hit the ground and launch position, they were in the same. I got another sheet on my phone, a picture with 24 of the greatest right-handed hitters of all that. And they all look the same. But did they look the same in the box? No, they all had different stances. All right? They had different stances. I'm telling you. You can stand any way you want. You can stand with your back to the pitcher. But watch what happens when my foot hits the ground. Where am I? I'm in that launch position. How about this? There was a big ligger that would stand in there like this, all right? And then when the pitch, pitch came, he'd go to the launch position, all right? You can be doing all of this, and there's a bunch of them to do it. And the reason they're doing this is because in a minute, they're going to do that same action, but this way. It's this action here that they're going to go and do here, all right? Maybe they're just feeling it, you know? And, and you can do this all you want. 
okay? <laughs> Still hit the shit out of it. But what I'm saying is you're going to be more consistent if you keep it simple. Okay? Great question. We had Rodney Donaldson, one of my ex-teammates' brother. He actually stands in the box looking at the pitcher. Stands just like this, facing the pitcher. Of course, when the pitch comes, he turns, and he's ready to go. Here it is. Here comes the pitch, and boom, he's able to hit it. But all that movement is going to cause inconsistency in the long run, okay? I'm not make, trying to make you guys cookie cutters and everybody hit the same. That's not – this game is all about authenticity, originality, all right? But there comes a point when that front foot hits the ground and it's go time, that launch position looks the same in every single one of them, no matter how they started their stance, all right? If you want to see those pictures, I'll show them to you. But it's really interesting. From Babe Ruth to uh, Trout, Steve Trout. They all look the same. All right. Good job, guys. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. I wish you guys the best of luck. Enjoy the game. I'll try. Play it until you're 72 years old, right, baby? All right.